Yeah. Okay, we are recording. Lucy Pinner, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right, mate. Yeah, not too bad. And a nice, nice calm weekend. Like, did you watch? Um, did you catch any of the Foo Fighters uh, gig that was on I over the weekend? See, I, I haven't seen any of the like live footage, but I saw mm. all of the stuff on Twitter and Instagram. It looked incredible. Yeah, I, I was kind of sort of flitting on and off because it was on like YouTube live. And then I just flicked over at the point when Taylor's son come out and played oh, uh, drums. I and mean, it was like, bottom lip was going and everything. Yeah. It was so uh, beautiful. And, yeah, uh, what, a, like, what a like bittersweet moment that was. Yeah, absolutely lovely. Well, tell me how you found putting a list of songs together today so hard good <laughs> and the thing is like I was because because my whole my whole family like we're we're so obsessed with music like music is massive to us always has been and it's kind of it, it's what brings us together and also it's what we've always like argued about and um when I was going through the list I was like I just have to be really honest and there were things that I was like oh I could put a cooler track in. No, there. never <laughs> yeah. do that. You can't be cool on this podcast. You can't be cool. And I just thought, no, I'm going to be authentically honest. Good. Answer these questions as honestly as possible. But it was still, it was still a few, a couple of them were still pretty bloody hard. Yeah. Have you got any like, or, I mean, you, you can have some honourable mentions. If there's some that you, you just can't edge that. Yeah, then, there's, uh, there's a couple that it was, it was very closely between. Okay two and I've gone with what I think is authentically true all right okay that's cool <laughs> we, 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 we'll throw that one in there as well yeah all right let's start track one I want you to tell me please the track that you think has the greatest ever intro right I'm, I'm going in early with some uh controversy mm -hmm. <laughs> but I have to honestly say that I honestly think the track with the greatest ever intro is Don't Stop Till You Get Enough by Michael Jackson. Lucy, you know that's mine as well, right? No, it's not. Yes, it is. Is it? <laughs> I did not know this. I swear. <laughs> I didn't know this. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll give you my angle on it in a bit later, but oh, fuck okay. me, it's amazing, isn't it? It's perfect. If that, I know it's really hard. So I, from like tiny, like when I was a toddler, you know, like toddlers have to watch something to go to bed on repeat. I had to watch, my mum and dad had a copy of The Making of Thriller. And that was my, when I was like two, that's what they had to put on before I went to bed. So yeah. I've grown up, I do not remember a world where I didn't hear Michael Jackson's music. I think I think Michael Jackson and Luther Vandross were the first ever cassette tapes my mum gave me. And I, I, and I was hooked, just absolutely hooked, obsessed. And I do, I think, <clears throat> I think Off The Wall is the best album ever. If, if oh, I really? To, yeah, if I had to listen to it. So I always ask people, I'm like, if you had to listen, you're only allowed to listen to one album for the rest of your life. Mine would be Off The Wall. I, I just, I think it's perfect. I think that 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 coming together of like Quincy Jones, lots of yeah. Rod Temperton, uh, Michael Jackson, obviously just coming off the back of kind of getting into his solo career. I just think it's, it's to me, it's like perfect. And that track, yeah. you cannot tell me even, you know, I've got friends who have, who kind of despise Michael Jackson, but you cannot tell me if you're sat at a wedding or you're at a festival or you're at a gig and that, the first few bars of that song come in, that, that, that makes you want to get up and dance. Nothing makes me dance more than that. That yeah. intro. So, because you've got two, haven't you? You've got like the edit. Yes. And you've got like the one with the, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, where he does a little bit of talking. Oh, that's it. And that's the thing. It's that whispering of like, and then they're like, oh, it's like. It's and just, then when them strings come oh in. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and to have a drop like that. Yeah. I, I just, I think it's perfect. And then, I mean, the rest of the track as well, but just that, yeah, just the beginning, just that build up, that like the tension and then him kind of, you know, talking very quietly and then a scream and then into it. It's just, yeah. I think it's perfect. I love yeah. it. it. It it brings joy in my body. Absolutely. I think it's like 
disco like is really good for that full stop i think yeah. like so many disco records instantly make you want to dance there's something yeah. about that kind of groove and and quincy jones knew that better than anyone and and it's really weird because he is you know he's a strange character michael jackson and uh I, I was lucky i've got a signed picture of him which i'm looking at now but wow. it was it was up in the house but it's yeah, now yeah. that it's now it's down in the, in the shed. <laughs> <laughs> it's been demoted but this but, is the thing like it's it is re it's really hard and it's like i remember like i didn't speak to my my best friend claire at primary school her i think her auntie worked for she either worked for like a record label or mtv or something and she came into primary school one day and was like oh my god I'm going to it must have been the dangerous tour because it would mm. have been, yeah it would have been a dangerous tour I didn't speak to her for two weeks I was heartbroken her <laughs> mum her mum made her buy me a frame not signed but a framed picture of him like in the bad outfit because I literally I was heartbroken I thought she was gonna say and you're coming with me and she just went oh I'm I'm going to see Michael Jackson's and exciting. And I was like, oh my God, heartbroken. Do you know what? That kind of level of spoiled behaviour, I, I can match that. Go on. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> uh, my mate got bad um, before me uh, on cassette and he wouldn't let me borrow it. I was like, can I just borrow it for an hour and tape it? And he wouldn't let me borrow it. And then about a week later, I was around his house and I put it in my pocket and I took it home. I copied it. And then I recorded, do you know that really bad song by Sister Sledge called Frankie? Yes. Like, I love Sister Sledge. That's not one of their Sister good Sledge songs. Sister Sledge are amazing, but it's not a good song. I recorded Frankie like nonstop on both sides <gasps> of his copy <laughs> and then put That's... it back in his hands. <laughs> That's evil. <laughs> That's quite, it's really bad, isn't it? That's, I'm sure when I meet my maker, that will get thrown at me. That's evil. That's more evil than actually, she says she didn't do it on purpose, but I think my sister threw Ribena over my Janet Jackson tape when we were little. So I just played it on repeat and she didn't like it. And I was like, you did that on purpose. She was like, I did it by accident. Oh, that's, it's funny, isn't it? Like how much those things mean to you, especially yeah. when you're a kid. Like it's like, it, it's it's such a passion but yeah oh I was I was a horrible little bitch about it fuming I was yeah uh, my, my behavior is just as bad if not worse <laughs> uh, <laughs> but he's, he's he's a strange one Jackson isn't it and it's it, it obviously I've, I mean I've done like 450 episodes of this now and a lot of people have chosen no one's chosen this record which you're the first uh, really? to, to choose this one for intro, yeah. And it's, it's, it's such a great record. But so many people have grown up listening to Michael Jackson. Like, you know, how can you not? He's the one of the biggest pop stars, if not the biggest pop star in history. And and obviously what has been said to have happened, obviously he's, he's, he's not been, you know, he was never charged with anything. It's murky waters. Mm. But I'm always intrigued with how people because I, I spoke to one of the kooks and they were like oh no kind of anything to do with, like a michael jackson record yeah. He, yeah. He, he said he was at I... a, a stevie wonder gig and and the dj put on i think it might even mean that stuff to get so i just walked home i was like man that's that's quite a reaction but yeah where do you draw I, I, the line I, with separating hard, the, the artist, artist from the yeah the artist and the, and the body of work it it's really difficult and it's something that I wouldn't even know really where to start with. I talk a lot about, me and my friend Beth talk a lot about this with the amount of the people who we looked up to, maybe not kind of to, to Jackson's kind of extent, but you know, the things that you read afterwards and you go, oh fuck, you know, there's a lot yeah. of dodgy yeah. shit going on with a lot of our like most loved, you know, the, the, the artists that literally have shaped our whole music taste in our lives and it's really hard it's really hard and even I do I get quite surprised if I hear radio stations playing Michael Jackson I'm like okay yeah. that's interesting and I still you know I I do still listen to his music I still love his music I I I kind of struggle with that myself I you know I I but yeah, it's, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I totally get why people are have kind of, you know, totally gone, no, I won't 
listen to that I won't play that a lot of DJs that I know are like I just won't play it yeah. you know as, you know as, as good as the as the work is but yes yeah, it's, it's a shame yeah absolutely all right let's take you back for track two Lucy I'm going to ask you to tell me the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you please so I've cheated slightly here. Okay. Because it's, it's not the first, I think this came out in, I've got it written down. I think this came out in 97. So I was, I was born the end of 83. So it probably, it's not, it's not the first ever song that I would have heard that made me emotional, but I Can't Make You Love, the, the Michael, uh, George Michael's version of I Can't Make You Love Me is just, my whole family loved we, we've all got quite eclectic quite different tastes of music me my mum my dad my sister we all loved Michael Jackson uh, Michael Jackson I <laughs> okay, see he's in my brain George Michael we we were all like massive massive George Michael fans and I think he did I think my mum and dad had like wham records that we grew up with and then when he went solo and just this this song never fails to make me want to cry. Yeah. Just his voice is beautiful. I think it was when he was at his absolute kind of vocally, I think he was at his peak. And I think maybe not exactly the same time, I think slightly after this, when he did one of the MTV Unplugged, mm -hmm. the like live acoustic versions of this, it just makes my, it just makes my hair, I, it's just beautiful. It's just, it's beautiful. And it, it never fails to make me uh, teary. Yeah. especially but, now especially now that was that was christmas day died wasn't it yeah that was a shit day wasn't, wasn't it? it shit wasn't it horrible and i he's he's the one you know i remember i remember where i was when uh when bowie died where i was when prince died like people who that it was a real shock and but there was something about George, my, like, my whole family were like, I feel like, a, I feel like a member of my family's died. Yeah. I always thought I was going to meet him. I had like friends of friends who knew him. And I just always thought I was like, I'm going to meet him and yeah. I'm going to be best friends with him. Everyone I know that knew him, you know, cannot speak higher of how lovely he was, yeah. what a generous, lovely soul he was. And I think he never realized, I remember listening to his Desert Island Discs and he's so humble and he's so like, I don't think he realized what a beautiful voice he had because he talked a lot about his writing, about his songwriting, yeah. which was amazing as well. But I don't think he ever realized how, how moving his voice was. 100%, I think, <laughs> It's really weird because I'm 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 nearly fifty, and so I I was lucky that I caught I was at school when Wham was happening, and every girl was obsessed with with you know fancying either George or um, Andrew. Andrew. Yeah. Uh, and then so as much as I liked all the Wham records, it was just like oh, this is a girls band. Yeah, like, it's a boy and, band. Uh, yeah, it's not for boys. Yeah, it's not cool. And then he went, <laughs> you know, I like Madness and Adam Ant. No, I don't like. Kind of wham. Like, wham. I loved wham. I just couldn't yeah. tell anyone. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I think like when um Listen Without Prejudice come out. Oh, amazing. Like I, it then meant I could kind of come out of my little George Michael closet and just go, this artist is fucking amazing. Yeah. And I remember hearing like praying for time for the first time. Beautiful. And and just thinking. You're so caught up in George Michael, the pop star. And as you touched on Elvis Desert on this, he was talking about George Michael, the songwriter. Never let it be overlooked how incredible his voice is. That vocal performance on Praying for Time oh, is gorgeous. off the scale. Yeah. And I, I literally done a radio show yesterday and played Waiting for the Day. Like, oh, because, I love Waiting for oh, the Day. It's my, it's my little favourite, that one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's up there. It's yeah. definitely up there. He's such a, an absolute superstar. And, and what I also love about him, um, aside from, you know, the fact that he just appears to have been this just adorable human being that everybody met just said was absolutely wonderful. When people talk about rock and rollers like Keith Moon and Keith Richards and people like that, he could give them a fucking run for oh, the money. Yeah. Like, 
he drove a car into Snappy Snaps. He put his dinkle in a Glorio and then made a music video about it. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> and just that self-awareness that he had and how he, yeah, I just, I think he probably had a fucking wild time. Yeah. And it obviously didn't, you know, the ending is really sad, but I just, yeah, like what an incredible man and an incredible talent. And, and it is that thing. And I think there's something like you touched on that, people who manage to come from you know something that isn't seen as cool or isn't kind of respected musically to then kind of have that you know I guess we've kind of got it now with like your Harry Styles and yeah. that thing of people going oh no actually and it must have been like it just must have been so not I mean I don't who knows if he ever realized it I don't think he did but to get to a level where people recognize you and have respect for the music that you're making like must have been just such a lovely payoff yeah so, yes, and, for sure. and and when you look back and the fact that everybody you know if you look at something like freedom or wake me up or edge of heaven like all got incredible intros by the way mm. um but all of them songs like they're not a manufactured pop band they wrote them songs yeah but you know that's incredible you know how why? young he was when he wrote completely them. like careless whisper yeah. <laughs> he, he wrote, wrote that like 15 or 16 yeah yeah like oh beautiful record yeah that, that he, was he's... that was the one that was the slow one at the school discos Always. where uh yeah hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, always. And just do like and I and I always I think one of my one of my like all time favorite live performances is him doing uh someone's love oh. at the Freddie Mer I'd like and, it, and have you seen the um the footage of him rehearsing that? Yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. Bowie, Brian May's there like with it and I'm just like it's iconic this beautiful man with this beautiful voice singing Freddie Mercury almost better, like yeah. insane. Absolutely, absolutely. So you've mentioned that you like to have uh, good conversations and, and, and arguments with your family about music. So you're obviously all very sort of passionate about it. So was it, tell me about where you grew up and, and, and was it a musical household? So yeah, so I grew up with my mum, my dad, my sister, who's only, she's like less than two years older than me, but she, so we kind of, I guess it would have been when I was maybe, tw would I have been at secondary school? Like I was quite into, I grew up kind of, I inherited all of my mum's kind of Motown. I loved a bit of like anything soulful, anything Motown-y. My sister was a little bit older than me when all the like indie Britpop stuff came in. So she had a very, you know, she was on Oasis really quick. She loved Radiohead. She loved Jean. Where I was still like listening to Rock and Robin and Mariah Carey in yeah. my bedroom, and we literally we talked about this. Actually, I saw her on Friday night, and we talked about us arguing about music. And she, I can remember being stood on the stairs, going to, "Oh, listen to your shit pop me. Why don't you go back in there and listen to your shit, Mariah Carey?" And I was like, "Oh, why don't you go and listen to Radiohead and be really depressed?" Like we used to like properly <laughs> argue about it. And I, and as I got older, I got into like Oasis, Radiohead, but it was such a, I, I feel like I said to her, I feel like I've got none of my own thoughts. I'm really passionate about, passionate about music, but I can track everything either back to like my mum, my dad or my sister. Yeah. I feel like I've just absorbed what they like, but we, oh, we used to have, I remember when me and my mum, like we did it for a joke, but we put, my mum loved Take That, like early Take That. And I, I liked them when I was like eight. Yeah. And my mum put a Take That poster up in our dining room. And my sister went absolutely, <laughs> she was going, oh my God. She was like, take it down. Mum was like, no, it's my dining room. I'm going to have it. And she was like, oh my God, like my friends are going to come around and see that. And then I think she like calmed down and said, well, can I put a jean poster up? And my mum was like, no, <laughs> she, was, she was so upset. But yeah, we used to always, my dad, my dad's a huge, like he, he's got a very eclectic, he loves music. We always had music. There was never not, mu and, and like different music coming from different rooms. I remember meeting someone who said, oh, I've never really been into music. And I nearly, I nearly had what? a stroke. I know, I, I, was like, I didn't know them very well. And I was like, 
what do you mean? They're like, oh, I just don't really, I'm not just not really into music. And I was like, oh, I have nothing to speak to you about then. <laughs> like, oh, God. I think I just have to be, look, I'm just going to have to level with you now. I don't think we can be friends. Yeah. yeah I, just, I was like, what a weird thing to say. That's like, I'm not into breathing. <laughs> Uh, the ones that I struggle with is just the people that, that kind of make a statement about it as well and go, yeah, I think the Beatles is shit. And I just think, you can't say that. Yeah. Like, they're not shit. Like, they're, they're, they're all right. Like, they're, I mean, they're actually really amazing. But, like, you can't just go, I'm just not really into them. It's like people that have to make a statement about hating the Beatles drive me this up the wall. like my, my sister when we were younger, they'd just be like anything that was like any, any kind of manufacturer. We were talking about on a, a, the other day about Beyonce. She doesn't like Beyonce. And she says, she says, I just can't get on board with anything that I feel isn't authentic. So now yeah. we're older, she can articulate that. But when we were younger, she was like, they're shit. I just <laughs> turn it off. You're listening to shit. But yeah, it's um, it's funny, isn't it? And I, I, I don't mind having it. Like we, I've got a WhatsApp group with um, my friend Beth and Harry, and we were talking about Robbie Williams the other day, because me and Beth have a certain view on on him that our friend Harry doesn't. But we had it was quite funny, just this like about an hour's conversation of us kind of going, no, I can, I can, I'm not saying someone isn't popular or successful it's just this is the reason why I don't think it's very good yeah you know and I like that I like a little bit of like I I adore um I adore the 1975 and a lot of people like if they don't like them they really fucking hate them Mm. and I think it's like a lot of my male friends that are like will really go in but I'm like no come on let's have a let's have a discussion about this let's get to the bottom of why Uh, well let's have this discussion because I know that that we're going to probably talk about them later yes Uh, and I want to talk about them because I've got an interesting take on that as well okay. uh, and it is very much in line with that kind of love-hate thing and yeah. I'm on your side by the way oh, good. Uh, but, yes. uh, but uh, yeah it's, uh, your, your sister would be pleased to know that one of our listeners of this podcast is Martin Rossiter of Jean. Um, oh Martin uh, he's lovely, so, uh, so he's, lovely Martin. he's beautiful isn't he yeah he's a lovely man um I've, the, the, the way that when I set this podcast up by right, Lucy, there was a few people that like I said that if all I want to do is really, really, really get to speak to Maxine Peake and Johnny Marr, right? They were the two people that I thought if I can ever get that to happen, it'd be amazing. I've been lucky that I've got to have Maxine. But I'm not Johnny Marr, if you're listening, you gotta get in touch. Uh, um have but you I, met him? No, like don't tell me you have. Like, no, I was gonna because I'm guessing that he's like one of your like heroes, like musically, and I just I I I wanted to to like get into whether you because I have a real like don't meet your heroes thing. I've like every one of my kind of heroes that I've been lucky enough to meet have really delivered and have been really lovely. Uh, but Johnny Mars up there, I'm I'm smothered in. Uh, the, the the words of the Smiths. Uh, they're, uh, they're they're one of my fave bands, and I just think he's the fucking coolest guy that walked the planet. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll leave Morrissey over there, Michael Jackson for yeah. a little bit <laughs> yeah. in that kind of where, where, where we stand on him. Yeah, sure. But, um, but uh, yeah, so I was, I was at the the London podcast festival, and I was just chatting to this this uh, this girl who, said, who listened to the podcast, and she was just like, oh, who, who else have you? Like you've been trying to get on. I said, Do you know what? It's a weird one. I'd love to get Martin Rossiter from Gene on. I said, but I've never, ever, like, I've, I've tried to find him. I said, I found him on Facebook and he hadn't posted for years. And he was like, I just can't find him. And uh, and I went, and I, I'm obsessed with Gene. And uh, so anyway, I literally had this conversation in the bar. And as I walked to the out of the bar to go to the toilet, I bumped into Martin Rossiter That's from insane. Gene. That's insane. It was, and obviously I was like, oh my God, Martin Rossiter. And he was just like, who the I've fucking hell you. is this? <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he obviously wow. just was like, who's this fucking random geezer like literally having a meltdown in front of me? And I'm wow. generally all right if I meet people that, are, you know, I'm really excited to meet, but it just blew my mind. I was like, and I was like, I, I've just been talking about wanting to meet you. And he was like, obviously really lovely. 
And I was like, you've got to come on our podcast. He's like, yeah, sure. And so, yeah, it ended up happening and he's, he's become Brilliant. a friend. And yeah, it was well, very when, surreal. When I mentioned I was doing this to my sister and she said, I, I've listened to that. She went, Martin Rossi was on that. I've listened to that. <laughs> oh, she's still flying the Jean flag. Oh, Love yeah. It. We went, did you go when he did the, he did the gig in Kentish Town recently? They did like two nights. Uh, for Jean or the Ukraine? It was, it was like a Jean. It was, it was Martin. His last two his, nights, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, I, I had tickets dad. to the warm up in Brighton. Oh, but... my, sis, my sister went to yeah. that. My sister went to that because my niece is at Brighton Uni. So she's <laughs> Wicked. Oh, yeah. nice. I'm glad your sister's as nerdy about Gina as me. Oh, she's That's obsessed. Great. She's obsessed. She, or, she has been like, they're her like number one. <laughs> We're getting we're going down a gene hole yeah. here, so let's let's <laughs> let's pull it back. Uh, Lucy, tell me about the song that reminds you of your time at school, please. So this, I went like I went that this makes me just feel like I'm back in the '90s. Is Supersonic by Oasis? Just I think I love Oasis, and I so many of their tracks, I kind of like pull me straight back into feeling like I'm in my school uniform. All the boys that I was friends with were just mad on them. My sister was into them really early. And I think they were my like gateway into kind of Brit indie and just supersonic. There's just something and like the, again, the, in, the when an intro just like evokes something in you. Um, I just think they're incredible. And I think, and I think Noel Gallagher's one of, I think he possibly might be my greatest songwriter lyrically for me. Um, I, and it is, it's just that thing when all those things come together and the sound of Liam Gallagher's voice and just that, just that sound that I know is kind of taken from a lot of different like stone roses. There were a lot of that kind of, I just feel like they took all of that, all of that sound of that like Manchester movement is just culminated in Oasis being fucking brilliant. Yeah, there was so, they got all of it, like all of the influences and put it all together and just added so much bravado to it as well. Yeah. Like, and Supersonic just smacks of it, doesn't it? It's doesn't such it. a confident record, isn't it? Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's like fucking swagger on a on a track. Yeah. And it was, it just, that whole, like, I think, because that came out in 94. So that that was off, that was off. Um, definitely maybe. Definitely maybe off the first, I think it was the, it was the first track. Is it the first uh, time maybe? I feel like it was like their first... Is rock and roll style not the Oh, first maybe. Time. We'll Google it. Um, yeah. But yeah, just that thing, it just, it just reminds me of being in my Westgate school uniform and of a time of like, kind of that, just moving into being a teenager and that, kind, that time for me between like 94 and 96, there are just certain things I'm like oh my god I remember exactly what it felt like to be going to secondary school like Euro yeah. 96 I remember they they played um cast walk away at the end of Euro 96 and like the Lars I think was used on some footage of one of the get and I'm like oh I just remember what it felt like and Oasis were just everywhere yeah it was such an exciting time for for guitar music like I've, I, I, I DJ and, and have like run a club for for 30 years and it's 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 an alternative club and you know from sort of like 90 to to, to 94 alternative music was still really quite quite underground I sound underground Nirvana had happened and that had, you know and the Stone Roses had happened but it was still kind of it hadn't gone mainstream mainstream there were still the lads that were just like, oh no, no, I'm not into that grand stuff. This is like just for a load of scruffy blokes shouting. When Oasis come out, and all of a sudden they've got them huge guitar songs, yeah. but they've got these cool haircuts, you know, they've got their cool Adidas tracksuits on, and they're talking about football, fighting girls. And it was like, oh, hang on. And I just saw alternative club culture change that year. Yeah. It was just different after that. And Noel says when he walked on stage, I read an interview where he said after Nedworth, as I walked out, he was like, I think I've killed the underground indie scene. It's like, oh, it, wow. it, I just took it to a different yeah. level. It was, yeah. and then, then that period that you mentioned, that 94 to 96, dance music, I mean, I guess you had the Prodigy and Chemical Brothers, but yeah. it was all about guitars. You know, yeah. it was like the biggest selling music was, was guitar music and was, you know, indie was, pop 
a it's massive, crazy. And, and, the, and British bands going like kind of universally massive. Yeah. And I was kind of, because my sister was two, so the difference between like 11 and 13 when that all started is quite a lot. And me and my friend Beth always say like, oh, we wish we were a little bit older when all that kicked off. Because we didn't, we were like listening to the tracks at home, but we weren't kind of out at gigs yeah. and stuff then. Because I, I can imagine that those early, like in the in the dock, in the supersonic dock, like those early gigs. Because I've never seen Oasis and obviously I don't think they'll, they'll ever... I can't see them ever kind of getting back together. But yeah, I just, I go, oh, I would really love to just like go back in time and just go to one of those gigs. Yeah. I was, I was lucky. I got to see them at South End. Um, they done a, they released a video called By the Sea of, uh, of, of the concert. And that was, and, and all my, all my doormen from my club looked after them oh, uh, while they were down. So I got in and, uh, and Verve were supporting as well. Very young Verve were supporting. Wow. And they filmed the video for Rock and Roll Star there as well. They were only released Did in America, they? but they filmed it at that gig. And like, if you got there early, they gave you this T-shirt to wear in the video. And it had Rock and Roll Star in different languages across the front. I've still got my T-shirt. No. And so, yeah, somewhere my my uh, my peroxide blonde <laughs> shocking <laughs> haircut is dancing cool. around in, uh, in South Bend somewhere in that That's video. That's very cool. <laughs> so... Tell me about, about school, Lucy. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I kind of, I was, I, whenever I think about that, I'm like, I, I quite liked it. I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. I kind of, school for me, it was kind of just very, um, like, I guess nothing very exciting <laughs> happened. But I kind of loved it. I loved learning. I loved um we were really lucky that growing up in Winchester, like we went to like a, uh, didn't go to private school or anything, but we had like a good, we went to like a good school um, in a, in a nice area. And I kind of, I was one of the, I, I was always um, very easily distracted was always, you know, in your school report was like very easily distracted, could do better. I remember the realization hitting me. I did pretty well in my GCSEs, but I remember thinking, oh, if I'd have actually, I'd have actually taken this seriously I, I could have done really well but yeah I just I remember kind of I just I, and that's the thing music with school really like slots in with like the the people I remember being friends with and you kind of find your tribe and I got very into all that kind of I, I had a group of friends that we were very into that late 90s um kind of American R&B so like we used to listen to, you know, like some of those kind of like they're a bit cheesy, like the silks or um, I loved SWV. I think yeah. obviously I think the first thing that got me in was the Michael Jackson, the sample mm. of human nature with them. Uh, I, I loved Tony Braxton mm -hmm. and I used to get absolutely ribbed for it. Everyone was like, oh, God. And I was like, I just I loved her voice. All of those like those really kind of saccharine American R&B love songs, Brandy, Brandy's Never Say Never album, like all of that. I, I remember when I first went to secondary school kind of discovering that and being like, oh, wow, yeah. I like this. And I think that's why I was a bit like, that's when me and my sister used to, because she was so diehard. She used to get NME and what's the other one she used to Melody get? Melody Maker. Yes. So she had like all of that. And I was just there with my singing along to Tony Braxton so yeah it was um it was in it must have been interesting for my parents having those two <laughs> like types of music going but then we would all come together over things like we all loved Bowie, George Michael, Stevie Wonder there were like things that we all just loved yeah. and there are songs that I remember like Yes by McCormick and Butler that, oh, like, what we a just record. all loved it what a fucking song oh yeah, that's that's as close to perfect as you can get. Isn't that it? Single. Isn't <laughs> yeah. it? I don't know anyone that could say they don't like that. So everyone, yeah. you play that song and people go, oh, my God, I love this song. Perfect. You said you was distracted a lot and could have done better. What was you distracted by? Was you a daydreamer? If so, what was you daydreaming about? I think I've always... I think this is why I love podcasts. I've always loved chatting to people. I think even when I was little, I just loved a good chat. I was always chatting. I was always like obsessed with finding out about people. So I think me and my friends were just, I mean, boys, you get to like secondary school and 
I went from being a very sport I was kind of, I, I was it was weird because I was very into sport and very into art when I was kind of little when I was at primary school and then I think you get to secondary school and hormones kick in and you get self-conscious and you know you're very kind of like I think our group of friends were trying really hard to be like we don't care what anyone thinks about us but really it was like well I'm not going to do that anymore because you know and I think yeah I think I was just and I used to like sit with a lot of I love um I love funny people I mean we, we all love funny people but a lot of my friends at secondary school were just hilarious like boys and girls so I used to kind of sit with them in classes and have a laugh instead of um instead of concentrating really what did you want to be where do I want to be what did you want to be at school what did I want to be so I when I was little I wanted to be a sprinter then I realized that was too much like hard work then I remember everyone when we first when we first went to secondary school and used to have like careers um talks at the time, I think for some reason we all wanted to be journalists or lawyers because we just thought they were rich. Yeah. <laughs> we were like, we were like, yeah, no, I want to do that. Why? Because well, I want to make money. Um, I do remember, I remember being a little facetious little dick once in a in one of those. And they said, What do you want to be? And I think it was when Euro 96 was on. They said, What do you want to be when you're older? And I said, I want to be, I want to marry a footballer, miss. <laughs> And they were like, why? I was like, well, because they're just cool, aren't they? I mean, like mad. But I think, yeah. And then I kind of, I think when I was leaving secondary school in sixth form, I've never been ambitious. Like I've just not, I've never had like ambition. I've wanted to do well, but I've never known what that is really. So yeah. I've just sort of, I've, I've coasted my entire life. And even back then, I remember getting to the end of sixth form and my media teacher Caroline keeping me back once saying if you thought about teaching I think you'd be a really good teacher and I said oh I thought it was really shit money and you all hate it and she was like it's all right she was like we get the holidays off <laughs> so I kind of like I think I left I love the fact she tried to offer you some advice a bit <laughs> really kind of you hate it don't you and you're a shit money <laughs> yeah I was like I thought you're always like I thought you don't get paid very well she's like it's all right we get the holidays off so I kind of in my head thought oh yeah I get six weeks off for the rest of my life so I kind of thought when I left sixth form I took a gap year but I was I was going to do English and film at uni and I think in the back of my head I thought I'll probably be an English teacher yeah that was kind of where I was headed before being sort of <laughs> being accosted on Bournemouth Beach and like falling into modelling. I, yeah. I, yeah, we were talking about this last night about like sliding door because we watched um, everything, everywhere, all the time. Have you seen that? No, what's that? It's a mad, mad, brilliant film. It's everything, everywhere, all at once. It's amazing. It's on Amazon. It's, it's mad. It's insane. I can't even describe it, but it's very much about sliding doors you have to watch it to, it's very mad yeah we were kind of talking about it last night and I was like those little decisions that just change your whole life path blow yeah. my mind um you then you know got got spotted on the beach you just said there and tell me about confidence was you a confident kid before that and how did how was your confidence when you're thrown in the public spotlight uh, and and I guess when you're you know as, as a model and and you're you know you're you're there and, and and open to ridicule you know by people and and to be judged and like how how, how did your confidence deal with that and how well, not just confidence how did you deal with that it's really, it's really weird because I look back. Sorry, Liz, like, so I focused on the negatives there. There's obviously a lot of positives that come with that as well, but it's just, it's just the confidence yeah, thing that I'm always no, intrigued I was, by. I was never, I was never very confident. I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, I'm not like quiet and insular, but I'm not an extrovert. I've never been an extrovert. I've tended to gravitate. A lot of my kind of closest friends have been the extroverts and I'm quite, I think I'm quite a kind of calm doesn't need the spotlight and I kind the way that I fell into modeling I remember from the beginning going oh I don't really like this but the money was so good and I remember not that like 
you know, my my mum and dad, we grew up quite comfortably, but I remember the times that when we were little that were a little bit scary were when we could hear our mum and dad kind of talking about missing bills or having to move, you know, we had to move house because because we didn't have the money to be in the house we were in. And I think there was a big emphasis from my outside world about how important money was. So when I was 19 was when I started modeling, 1920. And I remember kind of, there were a couple of people in my life that were very encouraging of it, who maybe I shouldn't have listened to as much. And I remember talking to my sister about it back then and going, oh, I don't really like this. And she was like, oh no, it's fucking weird, isn't it? She was like, it's fucking weird that you're in the paper. But in my head, I thought I'm being offered a contract that like two months will pay my entire uni, yeah. or, you know, my all of my fees. So in my head, it was one of those things I fell into and thought, this is going to pay my way through uni. And then it just every year, the contracts, the contracts got bigger, the money got bigger. And it kind of just I remember getting kind of. 10 years down the line going how how did this happen this was meant to pay yeah. to go to uni but not having maybe not having the confidence to at times where I could have take where I could have used modeling to go in a different direction not really having the encouragement around me like just having people going oh you're mad if you don't sign that next contract and get that money and I look back now and go oh that's a bit of a shame but also there's there's great things to it, but the confidence thing is mad because I compartmentalized it so much. Like it's not really, I would just, I would get the train from Winchester, you know, up, do a shoot, have a lovely day. Because when I was working with like the magazines that we were working with, we were all mates, you know, yeah. we, we were all, all, everyone on the, on set, on the shoot. So it was like, I'd go up once a month. I would do that. I'd come home. I didn't, I lived quite an insular life back then. So I, and, and we weren't on social media back then. I think that would have been a whole different, yeah. you know, I started in, I think 2004. And I don't think things like Twitter, I don't think they were around till about 2011. Something like that, wasn't it? Yeah. So I kind of, of course we saw some of the backlash and it, it's a very weird, especially with page three, it's so weird that it's, it's a job that people kind of unsolicited come up and tell you what they think about it. And you kind of yeah. sit there going, oh, I didn't actually ask, you know, but people, even in a nice way, people feel the need to go, oh yes, well, I, I think there's nothing wrong with what you do. And it's like, well, <laughs> I didn't, okay, <laughs> fine. I didn't ask you. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, go to the cashier at like Sainsbury's and be like, oh, do you feel, um, you know, uh, do, do you think you're being exploited? But I get why. I think I, I spoke about this with Pip on the um, on the Distractions Pieces podcast. I get why people do, because I think it was something that anything that's in the public eye like that, that does affect, that has an effect on society and culture and pop culture. I get why people do feel the need to kind of oh. talk about it. But um but yeah, it was just fucking mad. It was just mad. It was like a really mad, I look back now and I'm like, I don't know how that happened. Would you have done anything differently? <laughs> yeah, loads differently, which I know is like, everyone's like, don't have regrets. I'd, I'd have done so much differently, but then I wouldn't be, I get, I wouldn't be where I am. I wouldn't be who I am now. I know it's all very kind of cliched, but sure. I think everything happens for a reason. But if Absolutely. I had the knowledge now back then, oh, I'd have done so much differently. Yeah this better not be cool um tell me oh have you actually said the song which one for school oh uh, uh, supersonic supersonic yeah sorry yeah. okay yeah, yeah. Uh, we just went off on a tangent then it's like have you actually said the song <laughs> yeah, yet we actually about it. <laughs> <laughs> um tell me the first song you ever buy from a record shop please the first single i ever bought with my own money was don't walk away by jade God, I love that record. It's a brilliant record, isn't it? Yeah. And it came out and I think I saw them on top of the pops and was like, wow. And then I think we went, so how old was I? I think I've got, uh, did I write down the, the year? But we went to, um, so it was 92. So I was like nine, eight or nine. And um, 
I think we had to go to like Basingstoke or something. There was no like West Quay, the big shopping centre in Southampton wasn't built. And we, I think my mum and dad and me and my sister went to a shop, that, like the closest shopping centre, maybe Basingstoke. And I went into like a Sam Goody or an HMV. Yeah, Sam Goody, I've not heard that for years. <laughs> <Sam> <laughs> And I remember getting in the car on the way home and I was like, can I put my tape on? So my dad like put the tape in the car and there was on the, on the original single, there was, there's a clean version and there's a dirty version. Of oh, Don't okay. Play. It's not that dirt, but there's like a bit in the middle that in the radio edit isn't there, which is like one of them's like, this is what it sounds like when we make love. And they start like moaning yeah. and groaning. <laughs> so my dad, like we're driving home and we're, we've got this on. I just remember my dad like ejecting the tape and going, oh, I think, I think we'll listen to something else, sweetheart. I think we'll put something else on. <laughs> I was just like in the back, slightly mortified. <laughs> <laughs> oh. funny and they play I found it actually I found that I found the dirty version the um explicit version I think it's on Spotify right yeah I, I need to hear that because I've listened that has got a great intro with the oh, we'll get great. back to you too yeah and then the <laughs> doo -doo -doo. And yeah. when that beat drops as well it is isn't it <sighs> yeah that was um that was you say 92 like at that point I was just long air converse grunge through and through living the pearl jam dream but it was like i'd still kind of tie my hair back and put on like a shirt and a pair of school trousers on a thursday night to go to the club in town where they play that and it yeah. was like oh man i wanted to dance to that record all the time it's so good it's so good and i think and it's still like it's still on the radio a lot it's just mm. one of those like seemingly kind of like little pop songs that i think has kind of stood the test of time yeah all around that time when those like girl bands when like TLC were around and just those really fucking cool American R&B girl groups yeah I was like wow I want to be like her <laughs> I just loved them I thought they were I thought they were great yeah absolutely absolutely um you was talking about ambition and that earlier and and I'm always intrigued and I always like to ask guests about drive and and Throughout those, you know, that, that first 10 years of, uh, of, of modelling, you know, you, you said that it was like just sign another contract, but was, was there an element of drive to, to any decisions being made there? I honestly don't think there was. I think I was just sort of aimlessly going, oh, I'll sign another contract in a year. You know, they'll probably not offer me one. And I think it wasn't until I was about, 20 I think like 20 I think when I got to the kind of between like 25 and 27 and I started looking at what else I would want to do and I kind of was lucky enough to fall into a bit of acting around then and I thought oh this is fun I was like this is really I, I quite like this and I it, it's something that I even now at like 38 still think oh maybe I might want to go into like production or like I love that industry and I'm passionate about that industry and I think I've always I'm, I'm not necessarily the most comfortable in front of a camera, but I do enjoy acting. So falling into that, that's been something that's been a kind of interesting um, development in that I have more drive with acting than I ever did with modeling. Cause I was just yeah. very, with modeling, I was like, this is just happening to me. And I'm just, you know, I'm at the mercy of whether I, if they're gonna give me another contract or if this person's gonna keep me on for this. So I think, because I am, I'm a very indecisive person. I think this obsession with making the wrong decision, that whole sliding doors thing, I'm not very good at kind of taking the ball by the horn. So I just kind of let things happen. And then I think in my late, late twenties, up and up into my thirties, I was like, oh no, you can, there, there are things that you can make happen. Like yeah. if there's something you want to go for, and I think I've learned that quite late in my career that there are things like even doing like our Smashing Sundays podcast that I do with Beth and those things that it's like, oh no, I want to branch off into different careers. And there are things that I can do instead of just sitting and waiting and letting it happen to me. But I just don't think I've ever, I remember sitting, I remember, I think it was like at a Christmas dinner saying to my dad, to me and my sister get on very well with my dad. And we were like, like aren't you lucky that um 
we're just well-rounded people that we weren't like, you know, I said, if I had have wanted to be, if I'd have kept wanting to be a sprinter, I was like, sports people, they're pretty boring. And I was like, aren't you lucky that I have no ambition, that I don't have a lot of drive, but that you like sitting, having dinner with me. And he was like, I think I know what you mean. <laughs> it's like, yeah, <laughs> I think I know what you mean. And I was like, yeah. That's a surreal CV <laughs> you've just described there. <laughs> <laughs> that that's a very interesting I, I would leave that with a conversation i wouldn't take that to a job interview yeah, yeah. yeah no I'm ambition drive, but... no ambition. <laughs> I'm, I'm nice to have a chat too <laughs> <laughs> oh brilliant well look we, we, we spoke about home a lot so let's let's take you home for track six uh and tell me a favorite song from an artist from your home county please so this I, I think this, this is an underrated man. And I remember when he burst onto the scene uh, and we were all, you know, that thing when you're a teenager, like celebrity is like just so impressive. You know, we'd like, you know, my friend whose auntie worked at, um, I can't remember if it was a, a label or, or MTV, but that thing of like, oh, my auntie's met so-and-so. I remember like, Oh, was it like Shadow or Wolf? I remember someone from the Gladiators bought my uncle's first flat. And we went into primary school and we're like, you'll never guess who's moved into our uncle's flat. You know, that thing of like, when you're a kid being so consumed and impressed by celebrity. So obviously, so my, my track um, is Craig David, Fill Me In. Yeah. So I was probably too old to be really impressed by celebrities. So this was, I left secondary school in 2000 because we were the class of 2000, but we were just like, oh my God, like this young garage guy. And he's from Southampton, which is like 15, 20 minutes away from where I grew up. And all of that kind of, that UK garage around about that time that I, I loved some of it. And I, I just, I adored a bit of Craig David and fill me in. I, we, I went to see him this year at Pub in the Park and I was like, yeah, this is like being 16 again. This is so yeah. fun. And just those lyrics that were really like, you know, about like sneaking around with a boy and getting a bit drunk and blah, blah, blah. I just, I loved it. It was, I mean, he was huge, wasn't he? When that album dropped, you like, he was just everywhere. And I think... You know, that UK garage, and it's good that people put the word UK before garage because that whole garage sound couldn't sound any more British if it tried, you know. Yeah. Like, um, go on, sorry. I think the Artful Dodger, they yeah. were in Southampton as well. So all of like their stuff. And we were like, oh my God, like Southampton's part of a music scene. <laughs> like, it just felt like quite cool at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's something that I guess has, I'm I'm trying to think of anything that's that garagey now. I guess it all just it turns into like I guess like some of it like went down the grime yeah. kind of path and kind of back to like those just really good vocals. But yeah, like what a because I don't think I don't think the early, I think we kind of my generation kind of shit out a little bit because I think the early two thousands weren't the best. But I don't think yeah. anyone's. I, d I loved, I, you know, I loved a lot of the the R and B that was around, the garage that was around. I don't think we're going to be looking back on those years as being like particularly groundbreaking. I'm trying to think of stuff in the early two thousands that we still hail. That kind of early two thousands on on the sort of guitar front, it sort of shifted, and and because you, you've come to the tail end of like the kind of Britpop thing. All of a sudden, every put, everybody put away their electric guitars and everybody got out their acoustic guitars. And then all of a sudden, it was Travis, it was Coldplay, it was Embrace, no, Chewing no, Breaks. No, no. And they were all great bands. Yeah. Um, but things kind of got a little less rocky and a little bit more acoustic -y. And then the rock yeah. all kind of went to America with the whole new metal American pie culture kind of. Yeah. All of that pop punk, Blink 182, all the guitar stuff kind of went stateside, I think, really, yeah. for, for that whole Limp Biscuit nonsense. And there was just a lot of like, I don't think I can blame, but like, when was Pop Idol and stuff like that first around? Yeah, like, like of course, then. That, so that was like a resurgence in that kind of, you know, forgettable pop music. 
But I mean, there are still there there are still some like great people, I guess, that started in the early two thousands. But I just even when we were when I was kind of thinking about this and I was looking at it, thinking, I guess I was into like I was into Destiny's Child, I guess, in the early two thousands. But yeah, they just not that same kind of passion inspiring like life changing music around there weren't time. Like big movements do you know what I mean yeah, big kind of like yeah. moments that spiked youth culture where like you know it literally moved into what everybody was wearing and things I don't think there was a anything as, as big as maybe what we'd seen in the previous decade you yeah know? yeah because the 90s was so rich with that yeah absolutely absolutely and, and I think everything kind of started to crash a little I think like all of that bravado of the 90s and all of that kind of new labor and, and everything being this big plus and and I think everything just kind of fell a little flat after that yeah. and uh yeah. and we've never recovered since <laughs> no <laughs> but let's shout out pure and simple by hearsay that's a banging tune <laughs> my sister hated them so much she used to call them heresy <laughs> She was That's like, yeah. Great. What yeah. a tribute band yeah. that would have been. <laughs> yeah, like a like a punk metal hearsay tribute. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. It's your last track, Lucy. And this is where you play Tastemaker. So oh, please. Have I, not got, have I not got um the song that tries oh, to Oh my god, yeah, you missed, comes, oh. You're trying to miss me out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's not. I've skipped track five. Let's, go, let's go back. Let's go back. This is what this does kind of fit in to what we were just saying okay so this was around so I didn't really you know I lived in Winchester I was a bit of a square I kind mm. of like the only things I really went to I think we had one it wasn't even a nightclub it was just like a pub that was open late called the Porter House mm. so the only sort of clubbing I did when I would when I should have been you know whatever was like R&B nights at the local like Winchester pubs and clubs <laughs> so my track is Bootylicious by Destiny's Child. Watching. That comes up, and that, like, the edge of 17, the yeah. example, there's a little, like, there's a bit of a, like, Jackson, the, there's, like, a break in the, like, last third that's a bit of a Jackson's tribute, and I just, yeah, if that came on, you know, it's that thing of, like, drunk girls going, I need to get to the dance floor. If that came on, that was my, that I had to get up and dance to that. Yeah. I think that, I mean, that's an intro, isn't it? I mean, whether it's that or Edge of 17, they're both yeah, absolute was, bangers, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. So, so, so you was a dancer. You, you, you're always happy to have a dance. Still? I'd get up and have a dance. I have to, I've got this thing that me and my sister have both got, that we are music snobs, that if I don't like the music, I cannot dance to it. I, I get that. Can't, can't dance to it. Yeah. And even like, you know, like I'm not an ABBA fan. I can kind of get on board, but I just, I just, can't but if it's an r&b song i know i i love like if i know all the words to a song i'm in heaven just drunk on a dance floor just screaming out a song and having a bit of a dance yeah i i i went to ibiza for the first time a few years ago and i was just too late to the party like uh i was the only guy there that didn't have a six pack and i didn't have a six pack by quite a way as well <laughs> and uh <laughs> And I just, and I think I was probably the oldest guy on the island. And I was just thinking, I really wanted some like really bohemian experience of, of and, and I was like, oh, I've literally just got Jumping Jacks Basildon, but in a hot place. Yeah, <laughs> this is the thing. The right places in Ibiza are beautiful. Because I I've was never them. like, yeah, when I was younger, I was so snobby about Ibiza and was like, oh, I'd hate to go there. And then I went there on a model shoot. And we had this like, be we just went to like beautiful beach bars and it was, and I was like, oh my God, there's this, I thought it was all like dropping E's and like mm. losing your mind to drum and bass. And I fell in love with it, but yeah. not the kind of, I, I did, we did one, I did one trip there that was like more clubbing that my friend who's like a DJ and she, I think we did like a club every night. I drank Diet Coke the whole time. I did, I'm like not in, I'm nothing against people using recreational drugs, but it's just not for me. I'm terrified of them. So I just wanted to like, just be sober and experience it. And like, 
one of the nights was superb, which was Glitterbox, which is and it was that's where there. I wanted to go, and no one wanted to go yeah, there. That's the only <laughs> one. That's what you'd have loved it there. And we walked in, and they were they were playing um, like Young Hearts Run Free. Oh. There were beautiful these beautiful drag queens everywhere and performers, and it was just all mixes of like disco. 70s mm-hmm. soul music and I was like oh this I I can 100% get on board yeah. with but then we went where did we go was it DC 10 that was just very like I just got in there and I was like there's gonna be some teenagers having a horrible time and it's like it was just <laughs> it did not feel nice yeah. I didn't like the music and I was like no this isn't for me okay let's uh, let's do the last track now. I'm so sorry I skipped track five. I think we've, we, we've just had a right old natter and it's yeah. going all over the place. So I'm just kind of parking up about. the questions. Um, tell me a song that you think uh, many people may not know that you'd like them to hear, please, Lucy. Okay. So I don't know. I I haven't got a grasp on how many people. I, I love the 1975. They're my favourite band. I think they're the best band in the world. I'm in love with them. Um, I would die for them. I'm obsessed with them. I know loads of my friends who are very cool, who listen to Radio 6 and have very cool, that are really down on them. Um, I, th- I, I think they're genius. I think the production, I, you know, I followed them from day dot. And I think even those first tracks that they did, like the production, the layering, the lyrics, I just, I think they're, I think they're beautiful songs. But the one that a lot of people might not, if you're if you're sat there listening, going, oh, I can't stand the 975, they're awful, blah, blah, blah. I just would please ask that you sit down and listen to I Always Wanna Die Sometimes, because I think it's just a beautiful song. And it's like, they're, they're, I think I'm like the, the 1975 nuts in our family, but like my whole family kind of likes them. So my dad really likes them. And my niece really likes them. So there's like my 19 year old niece, me and my dad that love them um, and just talk about them all the time and talk about the tracks all the time. And I went to, I've seen them, I think I've seen them six, six times and I went to see them a couple of weeks ago at Reading Festival, which is hell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's be honest, it's Reading Festival for anyone above the age of 16 is hell, but I will go and watch them in hell and just, I think it's the best I've ever seen them. And when they did, they did I Always Want to Die Sometimes. I've taken my niece to see them twice. And just her little face, the way she looked at me when they did that. And she went, I think this is my favourite one that they've done. Oh, it was just, it was cool. And there were like teenage boys crying in front of us. And I was like, this is beautiful. I, I, when I first heard Chocolate. Oh, it's a banger. Well, I didn't like it. Oh, I love All it. Right? And I was like, this sounds like some kind of like in excess kind of, I, I, I just couldn't get my head around it. And people were telling me that the press were writing really favourable things about them. Uh, and I was just like, nah, and I'm not feeling this. Uh, then I heard Sex and I was oh, like, I love sex. fucking hell, that is a single. Yeah. Uh, and and I, but I sort of parked it up. And then I can't think what I put out after that. I just weren't interested. And, and I kind of, I didn't hate them because I know a lot of people who just go, I fucking hate the 1975. Oh, so many of my friends. And <laughs> all of the people on my, like a lot of people on my club social media this week that were going to Reading were originally going to see Rage Against the Machine. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, fucking 1975. And I was just like, I mean, that is a strange band to replace Rage Against the Machine with. But yeah. I know that that singer will just fucking own that moment. And, yeah. uh, and then I heard uh, a friend of mine who's, who's a DJ um, and a, a, a musician, and he interviewed, um, it's Matt, isn't it? Matt, yeah. And uh, he interviewed him uh, about the new record. Yeah. And I put that album on and I heard Give Yourself a Try, and I was like, holy shit, this is fucking amazing. Yeah. And then I heard Love It If We Made It, and I was like, holy fuck, like, that album blew my socks off, Lucy. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm just on board, so on board. And like, 
one of the things that I do if I if I have a few too many glasses of wine is I'll go on YouTube and I watch live performances because crowds make me cry. At yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I'll just sit there trying to make myself emotional watching uh, big performances where <laughs> yeah. I can hear the crowd singing. It's weird, but I love it. Me and me and Pip are going to be doing a podcast episode soon about emotional moments in crowds, like wow. because it's what we both do. And I sent him sex at tea in the park, Amazing. like um where it just goes and in the middle eight when it breaks down Matty sing, starts singing here we, here we fucking go yeah. and the crowd just hey, scream it and it's like oh my god this is I've literally just got goosebumps and like it's it does have so the, the first time I ever saw them me and my dad went to see them at Southampton Guildhall and my dad always says he always says he's like best gig I've ever been to because it was full of sixteen year old girls. So there was no queue for the men's and there was no queue for the bar. <laughs> so he's like, not. it was great. <laughs> but, and and so it was like in a smaller venue. And I remember it was when Matty kind of he was in that like curly haired. He'd come out with a he'd come out with a glass of red wine and a cig. And my dad said he he comes out like this sort of mix between like. Because uh, he, he, I think he get, I think they get a lot of shit. They get a lot of stick because they do kind of bend genres. Like I think he did in his NME. I think he did oh, it was the NME interview when he said like, I just want to do all sorts of stuff. I want to make a rock single. I I want to make a pop single. I want to do. That. And he's like, I think people get really like snotty about like, oh, they're just an electro pop band. And it's like they make fucking amazing songs. Yeah. If you don't like, you know, it, it's all a little bit you know it's 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 to anyone's taste isn't it but I do think and the fact that like you know that he's got actor parents I think people get a bit you know funny about that but I just there's something about I love their music I think he can be a bit of a I think he can come across as a little bit of a facetious little twat sometimes first but in time a very I see him hearing way I think he knows it I think I saw him on Buzzcocks the first time being interviewed and I thought don't like this guy yeah uh, <laughs> But I've watched a lot of interviews with him since, yeah. and like, but you want you want your pop stars to kind of rub you up the wrong way. You want yeah. your pop stars to be interesting, and fucking hell, you know, you mentioned the losses that we had with people like Bowie and Prince mm. that constantly fuck with genres and yeah. constantly reinvented themselves. Yeah. That's what you should be wanting your band to do. Like, and there's not... always something on like the new album. They've released three three tracks off the new album I adore two of them what the one part of the band I don't love and my dad I, I was talking to my dad about it over whatsapp and he was like it's it's giving me like a little bit Paul Simon he's 70s and I was like yes that's why I don't like I'm not really into that yeah I was like that's why I'm not really on board with that so but I you know there are I love listening to their album and going fuck I know exactly where that's come from I, I can hear the influence in that but this feels really new and there's just something about my my 19 year old niece when I said to her what's your favorite what's the best track what's the best gig you've ever been to and it was the first time I took her to, she, she said like her first gig was Coldplay with her whole family and she was like that was really nice but in a very big then she went to like I think the first one she went to on her own was I can't remember. She was like, that was really fun because I was on my own. She said, but my favourite is the 1975 because of the way it made me feel. She went, the way they made me feel and being in the crowd and feeling that collectively, there is something, I'm just reliving my, my, miss, my misspent youth with them. I, I just, I took, so at, at Reading, my friend is actually, I've, one of my friends is best friends with um, the bassist. And he was like, I can get you backstage. He was like, I'll get you and your niece backstage and I literally was like no I was like I can't I was like thank you so much I said that's so kind and I don't want to seem ungrateful but I cannot meet them <laughs> it's like you don't understand and he was like oh no I get it like meeting your heroes and I was like no but I literally like I go to sleep listening to like undo like I I'm like they literally mean so much to me I cannot risk them not wanting to be my best friend and invite me on tour like literally anything <laughs> anything below that is gonna not be enough. shit so I just <laughs> and then we were literally stood there and I saw my friend he was literally next to Matty Healy on the stage and part of me was like oh maybe I should off but I thought no I like being in the crowd enjoying this because yeah I just think I'd die if I met them I think I'd absolutely die I think I'd faint because you know you don't want them to be kind of real I know they're real I know they're real flawed humans but I don't want to 
I, you know, and I think the fact that he can be a little bit, like Matty can be a little bit facetious and a little bit like, you know. But also, Instagram, I thought, oh, if he upsets me, I'd be devastated. But with with pop stars now, everything's so accessible, isn't it? And everything yeah. is is so like, and you know, one of the things that I, I liked about Prince and 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 back then Morrissey and people like Michael Stipe and and you know and, and Michael Jackson, all of these artists and Bowie, like you don't need to know what the fuck they're having for breakfast. You don't yeah. need to see them like sitting in their garden. Do, like you, there was magic there, and I think that. I do think that the 1975 are kind of good at playing that game. They they keep a yeah, nice air of like magic. To, yeah, and he plays up to like Matty Healy on Instagram, kind of like I think he must sit and search himself and he answers like all the shit. So when they performed at um was it the Brits performance and one of the I forget which music video it is, where they have all of the negative like Twitter comments about them. And is that love it if you Brits. made it? They did, I think it was Sincerity. Oh, maybe, it, no, I think it, I think at the Brits, the performance was Sincerity is Scary. I think the music video is before, oh God, what is it? It's not Love It If We Made It, it's before that. It's not the sound, maybe it's the sound. But yeah, they kind of go, yeah, this is what people say about it. And I, I think, yeah, to have like the audacity and that front to go, this is the shit that people are saying about us, but the people that we're making music for love this music and we love making it and we're going to keep doing it. And it's a, a bit of a like, well, fuck you kind of thing. Yeah. You don't have to like it. But I, I just think he, I, I, I think he's quite self-aware. I think there was a recent Guardian interview with him and, and, the, and the interviewer says he just seems very indecisive. He says one thing one minute and then goes, oh, but, you know, I don't really... He's like saying how nervous he was about Reading and then going, oh, but I don't really care. You know, if people do slag us off, they slag us off. But I think... I just love their music. I love his lyrics. I just... I adore them. I think they're fucking brilliant. Yeah. Well, for those that are, are, are doubting how good the 1975 are, we'll make it easier for you to, to, to get into them because uh, that track, and we'll put a couple more on there as well, that track will make the uh, the Spotify playlist that accompanies this podcast alongside all of the other tracks that, that Lucy's chosen today. Um, aside from following the 1975 around, <laughs> what else is, is, is coming up this year, Lucy? <laughs> Just lots of art, oh, just so many auditions that I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm squirreling away with the acting. Um, me and Beth, we've got loads more Smashing Sundays coming Wonderful. out. I mean, they're so, <laughs> was it? I can't remember. It might have been Alice. It's somewhat, one of our guests was like, it is a bit of a mad format, this, isn't it? And we were like, yeah, we just sort of like chat. Yeah, about anything. But we love making it. And we've got like some stuff in development with that to kind of build that so yeah I'm just I'm doing my usual stew I'm just I'm not planning anything no no plans no failures right so no ambition no drive <laughs> see where these sliding doors see take me see where it goes see where it goes <laughs> oh well Lucy I've had such a lovely time today mate it's been oh, really it's been lovely I really could have nice. hours oh wonderful honestly and if people want to keep up to speed with what you are doing where's the best place to to keep up with speed. Uh, so I'm Pinder Picks on Instagram, off of me being a 15 year old girl, um, and L Pinder Official on Twitter. Oh, well, if it's cool with you, we'll tag you in it when this comes out. Yeah, and amazing. So people can go and find you if they haven't already. Um, Lucy, thanks again, mate. I'm going to press stop. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for having me.